He also said in The Descent of Man, so in a published work, quote, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. This was a very prominent and fairly common idea among uh, Darwinists in thinking about their inegalitarianism and then the struggle for existence resulting in extermination and death for those uh, who were considered unfit or less fit. Okay, my sixth point then. That was the human struggle for existence now, sixth point. Darwinism viewed death in a whole new way uh, than had a traditional, certainly traditional Judeo-Christian thought. Darwinism saw death as producing progress. After all, the human struggle for existence is producing greater complexity uh, in <clears throat> organisms. And so he saw death as being an engine driving the, the evolutionary progress. Uh, and although Darwin, by the way, some note that Darwin didn't really believe in teleology, and there are times when he says he doesn't uh, believe in his work, uh, promotes the idea of progress, but actually he uses words of progress throughout uh, The Origin of Species and Descent of Man. And just one quote uh, that I think illustrates this, in The Origin of Species, Darwin says, thus from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. This, by the way, is a secular theodicy. Theodicy means a justification of evil, a, ju a justification of God in the face of evil. Of course, it's a secular one because it's pushing God out of the picture, but it's justifying natural evil by claiming that a higher good gets produced by natural evil uh, in the world. This was a very common idea as well. Uh, Friedrich Helvoldt, who I just showed you the slide on with his uh, history of culture, uh, said in that history of culture that humans, quote, the, the fitter humans rather, quote, stride across the corpses of the vanquished. That is natural law. Okay, so here we have a scientific justification for uh, the death of the vanquished in this human struggle for existence. Now, this took place not only in terms of racial extermination, which I've just talked a little bit about, but it also took place on other levels. There were quite a number of Darwinian thinkers in the late 19th and early 20th century who used Darwinian thinking to justify abortion, to justify infanticide. I already mentioned uh, Ernst Haeckel there, and also euthanasia. And in these two books uh, that came out fairly recently, uh, the first one on the top there by Ian Dalbiggin, uh, he's at the University of Prince Edward Island. His book, A Merciful End, The Euthanasia Movement in Modern America. And then also Nick Kemp, Merciful Release, The History of the British Euthanasia Movement. I should say, too, that these two guys ideologically are poles apart. Uh, Dow Biggin's a little skeptical toward euthanasia, whereas Kemp is very uh, supportive of euthanasia. Uh, both of them admit that Darwinism was a key point in the conversion of people toward euthanasia and were that leaders in the early, early euthanasia movement uh, in America and in Britain uh, were very influenced by Darwinian thinking. Dalbigan said this, quote, the most pivotal turning point in early history of the euthanasia movement was the coming of Darwinism to America. So he said that was the most important point in, ideologically in winning people over to euthanasia. Uh, Nick Kemp largely agrees with that assessment saying, quote, while we should be wary of depicting Darwin as the man responsible for ushering in a secular age, we should be similarly cautious of underestimating the importance of evolutionary thought in relation to the questioning of the sanctity of human life. So again, admitting that this is an extremely important part in, in stripping away the sanctity of human life was the Darwinian uh, uh, theory and uh, subsequent worldviews that were uh, being built upon it. Now I think the importance of this uh, perhaps goes without saying in many ways. Uh, in my own work, I have looked at how this has led into Nazi ideology. And in fact, as I told you at the beginning, I wasn't really even thinking about Hitler when I began my study. It's only as I began studying some of these eugenicists and what they had to say about the value of human life that I even began to, to think about Hitler and to realize that, yeah, what Hitler was saying is very close to what some of these other people have been saying that I've been studying here. So here, just to give you one quote, uh, is, there is a place in humanity for murder, 
That is to say, by killing the unfit. Sounds a lot like Nazi ideology. Next one. Chloroform unfit children. Show them the same mercy that has shown beasts that are no longer fit to live. That sounds a lot like Nazi ideology, but these guys weren't Nazis that wrote this. The top quotation is from Havelock Ellis, who was a prominent physician and sex reformer, a progressive uh, in early 20th century Britain, and wrote quite widely on sex reform <clears throat> at the time. And eugenics, by the way, was an ideology that was not the province of the right wing, as sometimes it's been caricatured. Uh, eugenics ideology was very, uh, and scholars acknowledge this pretty much across the board, was very uh, popular with the left as well, and progressives. In fact, the very earliest eugenicists were themselves progressives. Some of them called themselves socialists, uh, even, or at least were sympathetic with socialism. Uh, but not with the, I should say, not with Marxism, because they weren't egalitarian. This second one here about chloroform the unfit children, this comes from Clarence Darrow, the American uh, who was the defense attorney at the Scopes, famous Scopes trial relating to Darwinism. He was defending Darwinism at the Scopes trial uh, there. And he was also then a prominent uh, supporter of uh, infanticide and euthanasia based on his uh, Darwinian thinking. And again, notice the word unfit is in both of those uh, quotations as well, showing the connections there with uh, the Darwinian kind of thinking. Now, I think what this has to do with Hitler is probably fairly obvious. I don't need to spend a lot of time on it. If you want to read more about it, the last chapter of my book talks about Hitler and his ideas. In fact, the last chapter is called Hitler's Ethic, which is not an oxymoron, by the way. A lot of people think that, that does, that's sort of contradictory, Hitler's Ethic. In fact, I actually gave a talk one time at a university where I, was, I, I laid out the table of contents for my book. And the last chapter on Hitler's ethic, one, one of the uh, persons in the audience in question and answer time quipped and said, well, I guess that last uh, chapter is going to be kind of thin, huh? And I said, oh, on the contrary. I think Hitler did have some very coherent, albeit pernicious, uh, moral views. And in fact, uh, very interestingly, the very day that I sent my manuscript off to the, my publisher, the very final manuscript last July, I received an email from someone telling me about a work uh, by Claudia Kuntz at Duke University with Harvard University Press that just came out called The Nazi Conscience. Uh, and her work, in fact, corroborates a lot of what I say about Hitler and his particular views, at least that he has a coherent ethic. She doesn't argue for the Darwinian uh, angle, uh, however. She doesn't really talk about the anti scenes at all. So my work actually fits uh, together kind of nicely with hers, uh, in fact. But I think what it has to do with Nazis is pretty obvious. But here's a Nazi poster uh, to sort of make a little more explicit here what we're talking about. This Nazi poster sounds a lot like uh, the one I showed you earlier with the American Eugenics uh, Society at the fairs and such. 60,000 marks is what this mentally ill person costs the national community in a lifetime. Comrades, this is your money too. And uh, once uh, the Nazis came to power in uh, July 1933, just six months after they came to power, they passed a law of compulsory sterilization for those who were considered mentally or physically handicapped, especially those who were institutionalized. Uh, and they uh, carried this program on extremely vigorously, sterilizing several hundred thousand. In fact, they sterilized half the population, uh, excuse me, half a percent of the population of Germany was sterile, compulsorily sterilized in their sterilization program. <clears throat> then when World War II broke out, they began a so-called euthanasia program. Now, but this was not voluntary euthanasia. This was the murder of the mentally and physically handicapped who were institutionalized, which began in October 1939 and was carried out in six uh, killing centers <clears throat> located throughout Germany in which they killed about 70,000 mentally and physically, mostly mentally, but also some physically handicapped uh, people. Uh, and this is considered by many scholars the uh, first step of the Holocaust. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a, a book called The Origins of the Nazi Holocaust uh, by uh, Henry Friedlander, in which he argues that the euthanasia campaign was the opening salvo in uh, the Nazi Holocaust. <clears throat> There was a close connection between these eugenics ideas and his racial ideas. The inequality was simply on a different level there. But you might ask then, okay, 
You know, these ideas were around in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, we see that Hitler bought into ideas of, uh, about social Darwinism and such, but didn't the demise of Nazism uh, bring about a death or deal a death blow to uh, eugenics ideology, to ideas about racial extermination, Darwinian racism, uh, and such? Yes, in many ways it did. Uh, the word eugenics itself uh, came into disrepute. Uh, after the Nazi period, partly because of what the Nazis did. That wasn't the only factor, but it was one uh, important one. But nonetheless, Darwinian devaluing of human life continued to occur uh, simply in different kinds of ways. And now I want to jump just a little bit uh, and move on to contemporary, the contemporary scene to show you that this is not just something uh, that was taking place uh, back uh, 50 to 100 years ago, but it's something that's still an issue today. First of all, oops, wrong one, here we go. Peter Singer. Peter Singer is a very prominent uh, a philosopher. He's at Princeton University now. He's from Australia. Uh, and interestingly, uh, he, his parents fled the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, but he's been accused very often of uh, having uh, Nazi kind of ideas because of his uh, devaluing of human life. Now notice on the left uh, book there, the Darwinian left, I was trying to bring up something here to illustrate that Singer is very committed to Darwinian ideology. Uh, and he believes that uh, the left or the progressives need to incorporate Darwinian thinking uh, into their uh, political ideologies. And that's what that book uh, is about. But then on the right, you see his book, Rethinking Life and Death. And this is more of what Singer is actually known for. Singer is known for his bioethics uh, and particularly his stance favoring voluntary euthanasia as well as infanticide uh, for infants uh, who have uh, mental and physical handicaps of various sort. Now, Singer does draw a very direct correlation between Darwinism and the uh, sanctity of human life, or I should say the undermining of the sanctity of human life. Singer uh, claims in one of his essays, in a, it's not in either of these books actually, it's in a different book, uh, but he argues that Darwinism, quote, gave what ought to have been its final blow, quote closed, to the sanctity of life ethic. So he says Darwinism should have uh, destroyed Judeo-Christian idea of the sanctity of human life. Now he admits that it hasn't, Judeo-Christian sanctity of human life ethic is still persisting, but he wants to give it the death blow now. <clears throat> Uh, through his philosophy. Uh, Singer not only promotes uh, infanticide and voluntary euthanasia, he's also very strongly into animal rights, uh, which is uh, also part of uh, the issue of speciesism that I mentioned earlier, the blurring of the distinctions between the human species and other animals fits right in uh, to that. Now, Singer's not alone. Uh, there are many other thinkers also who are uh, promoting, uh, Singer, I should say, is one of the more radical of them, but there are also many other thinkers that are promoting similar kinds of ideas about uh, Darwinism and its connections to uh, the devaluing of human life. This one by Daniel Dennett, who's a prominent uh, materialist philosopher in the United States. Uh, his uh, book, Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Evolution and the Meanings of Life. In that book, he argues that Darwinism acts like a universal acid dissolving uh, all other ideologies, all other uh, ideas, especially religion, uh, and also ethical ideas, though. And he does spend a good deal of time, deal of time talking about ethics uh, in that uh, book, although there are a lot of other issues that he raises uh, as well. In his talking about ethics, he does uh, briefly discuss the issue of the value of human life. It's not a major theme in the book, but it does get discussed. And he says that there are, quote, gradations of value in the ending of human lives. Well, if there are gradations of value in ending of human lives, this also implies, at least to me, that there are gradations of value of human life. And in fact, he goes on to say, uh, in thinking about sort of concrete steps here, he goes on to ask, which is worse, taking heroic measures to keep alive a severely deformed infant, or taking the equally heroic, if unsung, step of seeing to it that such an infant dies as quickly and painlessly as possible. 
Okay, so again, here is a uh, not very veiled uh, promotion of infanticide for uh, children that have some kind of deformity of sorts. So again, we have a similar kind of idea uh, percolating here in Daniel Dennett's book. And so apparently Darwin's dangerous idea is especially dangerous to the mentally and physically handicapped. And that universal acid apparently eats away at them most. Okay, let me stop there for a second. Okay, another uh, key figure today uh, is Richard Dawkins. He's probably one of the most famous Darwinists in the world today at Oxford University. Uh, in an article in 2001, and there are many other places I could look for this too, but I thought there was, this one was especially interesting. In 2001, he wrote an article uh, in which he advocated genetic engineering to try to produce uh, a missing link, if you will. He wanted to try to produce something as close to an Australopithecine as possible uh, to get back. He, he, call, he even called her a, a Lucy. Okay, so he wants to get back to a missing link. Now, why would he want to do that? And in fact, he even says he sort of uh, thinks that maybe he would feel sorry for such an individual, uh, such a, uh, a, an organism. I don't know what he would call it. Uh, sort of half human, half uh, animal, I suppose. He said he would sort of feel sorry for him because it would probably be uh, put in shows and such uh, and be shown off. But he said he nonetheless thinks it would be a great idea to do it because... He says he thinks that it would help destroy our speciesist illusion. And the speciesist illusion is the idea that there is a significant distinction and difference between humans and other animals. And so he says if we could bring on this missing link, if we could produce it genetically, figure out genetically what that must have been, you know, try to track that back, produce it through genetic engineering, then we can show the fallacy of, the different, of any kind of uh, sanctity of human life. <clears throat> In that same essay, I should uh, remark also that Dawkins also expressed the desire that if he ever got, quote, past it, that he would be euthanized. And some people probably think Dawkins has already passed it. Uh, but fortunately, I hope at least that most of those also believe in the sanctity of human life, and so they won't uh, help him out in his uh, request. Oh, there are many others, uh, and I could go on and on here, but uh, maybe just suffice it for one more uh, example, contemporary example, and that's James Watson. Again, he's the most famous geneticist around today. He uh, discovered, co-discovered the uh, helix model of DNA back in 1953 uh, with Crick. Uh, he uh, then became a head of the Human Genome Project when it was uh, started in the early 90s, 89 to 90. Uh, and has had a huge impact on the field of genetics. He builds his worldview very forthrightly on uh, Darwinian naturalism. I don't know if any of you saw Watson in the PBS special on genetics that was out like in January, I think, but he talks quite extensively about uh, Darwinism and the way that it undermines the idea of design uh, and such. He makes, in fact, quite a number of startling statements uh, in that. Uh, Watson uh, has never learned to mind his mouth, has never been known for his uh, uh, tact. <clears throat> He's created a lot of enemies that way, uh, too. But Watson proposes a new eugenics. He doesn't use that word very often. The word eugenics is still a little bit too much disrepute. A lot of times people say new genetics instead of eugenics. But they, he, actually, the word eugenics is actually uh, getting a little bit of a comeback in the last few years. Uh, and people are beginning to be less abashed about using the term eugenics in contemporary discourse. Uh, and he very forthrightly argues for human inequality uh, and biological inequality uh, in that uh, PBS special that focuses on him and his ideas about uh, new eugenics. And they're talking about different aspects of human genetic engineering and such to try to uh, get rid of. And by the way, there's a really interesting clip, by the way, in that PBS special where uh, Watson is talking about, he says, the lower 10% of people in, in elementary school. And he's talking about how they are inferior. He doesn't use the word inferior, but that's the point that he's making there. And he actually says, as he's going through that, talking about these 10% of people, he says, you know, we need to find a way to get rid of, uh, well, I mean, to help out these people who are in the lower 10%. And when I, when I heard that, he sort of stumbles over it a little bit. And I actually had to replay that about 10 times to really listen to exactly what he said and how he said it. And he really does say we need to get rid of, and then he, I forgot what the exact next two words are, but he sort of stumbles a little bit. And then he says, uh, help out those who are in this lower 
uh, 10%. But if you listen to the rest of the video, he's talking very forthrightly about, quote, getting rid of those with uh, various kinds of physical and mental uh, hereditary uh, illnesses. Well, in 1973, before we had a lot of the genetic technologies we have, especially diagnostic technologies, Watson actually proposed that we uh, allow parents to kill their infants after birth uh, because we couldn't figure out at that time, and you'll see this in the very top part of this, I've got the slide up here. Uh, Watson said in 1973, because of the present limits of such detection methods, meaning of genetic illnesses, well now he doesn't have that problem because they can detect a lot of them. Uh, not all of them, of course, but they can detect a lot of them now, so you can do, you can, he's pushing abortion very strongly now. But at this time he said, because of the present limits of such detection methods, most birth defects are not discovered until birth. If a child were not declared alive until three days after birth, then all parents could be allowed the choice. There's that word choice again. Uh, we hear so much in our society. <clears throat> the doctor could allow the child to die if the parents so choose and save a lot of misery and suffering. <clears throat> okay, let me close by considering the question then. In light of all of this, does Darwinism really devalue human life? I think I've shown conclusively that historically Darwinism has indeed devalued human life, leading to ideologies that promote uh, the destruction of human lives deemed less valuable or unfit. Those on the forefront in, pr in promoting abortion, which I haven't talked about much tonight, but if you look back at the early abortion movement, you see Darwinian arguments cropping up uh, quite strongly as well. Ernst Haeckel made arguments for abortion based on, uh, matter of fact, let me mention that real quick because I think that's a really interesting one. Ernst Haeckel argued that from conception, uh, a uh, person is a distinct human individual. But he was, he was promoting infanticide even. So he said that because they were still going through lower stages of evolutionary development in their earlier embryonic stages, it was okay then uh, to abort them, especially if they were uh, possibly going to have some genetic or hereditary, would be the word at that time, hereditary illness. But those in the forefront promoting abortion, uh, infanticide, euthanasia, and racial extermination often overtly base their ideas on Darwinism. Also, as I've shown here, those favoring a Darwinian dismantling of the sanctity of life ethic do have a good deal of intellectual firepower, both uh, then and today. Uh, and the idea is becoming uh, rather widespread in our society, as well as other parts of Western culture. There are, of course, various uh, religious and philosophical moves that someone could make to evade these conclusions. And some Darwinists have in the past, and some still do today, uh, vigorously oppose these kinds of developments of devaluing human life. And for this, we can be thankful. Uh, they construe them often as faulty extrapolations by overzealous Darwinian materialists, perhaps. However, it still does seem to me that there is uh, some kind of inherent logic in the move that these Darwinists are making in undermining the sanctity of life ethic. And if you think about those six points that I raised, I think there is a certain kind of logic to that, whether one, wants, whether one agrees with that uh, move or not, that does make this a very alluring uh, view. And so I really doubt that this kind of uh, view of Darwinian devaluing, uh, excuse me, of devaluing human life is going to disappear as long as Darwinism is ascendant. Because Darwinism has such profound implications for our views of humans and what it means to be human, and human nature, life, and death, it seems to me implausible to maintain that Darwinism can be fully disentangled from ethics or religion. In fact, Stephen Jay Gould, uh, who passed away recently, but was one of the most uh, prominent Darwinian biologists or paleontologists uh, in the world, <coughs> uh, argued that Darwinism uh, and science on the one hand and religion and ethics, on the other hand, are completely separate, totally divorced, having nothing to do with each other. He called this his view of the non-overlapping magisteria. So they don't overlap at all in any way. But even he failed to keep them apart when he actually, when push came to shove and when he began uh, writing. Uh, in his book, just to give one example, he has a book out called Wonderful Life, The Burgess Shale and the Nature of History. And in that work, uh, Gould argues for the contingency of history, that is, chance events 
drive history. It's not programmed in. As a matter of fact, he specifically says that if you replayed the tape of life, humans probably wouldn't exist. The closing words of his book, however, show that he wasn't really able to keep things separate the way that he thought he could. Uh, let me read to you just one, the very closing words to Wonderful Life. And so, if you wish to ask the question of the ages, why do humans exist? A major part of the answer, touching those aspects of the issue that science can treat at all, must be because Pykaia, which is a Burgess Shale chordate that he talks about in the book, because Pykaia survived the Burgess decimation. This response does not cite a single law of nature. It embodies no statement about predictable evolutionary pathways, no calculation of probabilities based on general rules of anatomy or ecology. Uh, he goes on, the survival of Pykaia was a contingency of just history. I do not think that any higher answer can be given, and I cannot imagine that any resolution could be more fascinating. We are the offspring of history and must establish our own paths in this most diverse and interesting of conceivable universes, one indifferent to our suffering and therefore offering us maximal freedom to thrive or to fail in our chosen way. Now that is just dripping with religious and ethical content. And he's claiming that he's drawing it from science, from the contingency of history. In fact, the very title of his book uh, that tells us the Burgess Shale and the nature of history should give us a clue that he is making a philosophical argument here uh, that goes way beyond uh, what uh, science, at least his version of science, just tell me the facts, uh, should be able to give us, especially given his own view that science and ethics don't overlap at all. Whatever one's stance on Darwinism, then, I think it's certainly safe to say that Darwinism has had a tremendous influence on ethical and moral ideas in the modern world. Specifically, it has contributed to the erosion of the sanctity of life ethic. And I'd close by saying that Darwinism really is a matter of life and death. Thank you.